Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at a very, very, very important problem in computer science, sorting. We can sort arrays and vectors to be in either ascending or descending order, where the order really depends on the type of data and the type of problem that we're solving. For example, here I have a few cards from a standard deck of playing cards. I have the values or the cards 2 through 10 and I put them up here in a random order. We could sort these in ascending order which for cards which are integers this would be from order of smallest to largest or we could sort them to be in descending order which for integers would be largest to smallest. We're going to take a look at how to solve this problem of sorting in ascending order in this video, but sorting in descending order is really a trivial change from our ascending order code and algorithm. So let's take a look at the warm-up task for today's notes, which will get us started in writing our code for sorting an array or a vector of integers. So go ahead and open up a file called sortingfun.cpp and gedit. Declare an integer array with the following integer values in them, in it. These values come from the exact random order that I put up these cards on the whiteboard. So you'll be able to trace the sorting of the cards on the whiteboard and match that with the trace of your algorithm using cout statements. We'll go ahead and declare the size of the array to be 9. And then write a function called print array that will print out each item in the array. And then print out the nums array so that you can make sure that everything is working properly in your sorting fun.cpp file before we move on to writing the sorting algorithm. All right, everything looks good so far in our sortingfun.cpp, and we're ready to write a function called sortarray, which will accept an array of integers and sort them in terms of lowest to highest, which would be ascending order. Before we do that, let's take a look at a little bit of background on sorting and why it is such an important problem in computer science. So sorting is a process of organizing items in a collection into an ordered sequence. The order depends on the data type and the problem. For example, suppose we want to sort U.S. city populations from largest to smallest. Here the data type is integer, and the problem dictates the integers are sorted in descending order. As another example, suppose we want to sort words in a document alphabetically. Here the data type is a string, and the problem dictates the strings are sorted in ascending alphabetical order. There are many different sorting routines. Here are some of the most common ones that you'll likely encounter in your computer science education if you continue beyond 121. Selection sort and bubble sort are probably the most commonly used sorting algorithms used to teach beginners. 
Uh, these are used in a Gattis book, and I've included them here. We're going to code up the selection sort algorithm in this video. Bubble sort is included at the end of this lesson for you to work through for extra practice. Uh, insertion sort is also a very common one. Uh, shell sort, merge sort, and quick sort, and heap sort. Uh, these latter ones are typically more efficient than these former ones, which is also a topic that you'll learn about uh, when you take computer science 122 and computer science 223. If you want to see a visualization of how sorting algorithms work, go ahead and click on this link here. It's a really great site to help people understand how sorting algorithms work. We're going to trace through an example using the cards on the whiteboard for the selection sort algorithm. But this site could be a great additional resource for other algorithms as well. All right, so selection sort. The idea behind selection sort is we want to find the smallest item in the unsorted portion of the sequence and add it to the sorted portion of the sequence. If we keep doing this, then each iteration, the sorted portion of the sequence will grow by one in size, and the unsorted portion of the sequence will decrease in size by one. Eventually, the unsorted portion of the sequence will be of size zero, which means the sorted portion of the sequence represents the entire sequence, therefore our sequence is sorted. So here's the algorithm. We're going to walk through this algorithm on the whiteboard, but before we do that, why don't you pause the video and read through it and see if either in your mind or on a piece of paper, you can kind of trace through how the algorithm works. Okay, let me scoot this a little bit closer so that those numbers are a little bit bigger and easier to read. Okay, so we've got four, eight, seven, 10, three, six, nine, two, five. And we wanna apply the selection sort algorithm in order to sort this sequence of numbers in ascending order. So if you read through the algorithm, you know that we're going to have two loop control variables I and J. So I is going to walk through each item in the list or the sequence starting at the first position. I is going to essentially hold the spot where we're going to place the smallest item we find in the rest of the sequence. Particularly, the rest of the sequence is usually called the unsorted portion. So right now, our entire list or our entire array is unsorted. So the unsorted portion is the entire list. Now, we're going to keep track of the smallest item we've encountered so far. and its index. So initially, when we're searching for the smallest item in the unsorted portion of the array, the value at i is our min. This tactic of saying the first item in a sequence is the smallest item we've seen so far should sound somewhat familiar because we've solved problems like this before where we're looking for the min or the max in an array. This is actually the exact same problem. But our loop control variable j is what's going to search looking for a value smaller than min. So j is going to start at the first item after the item at i and do a comparison. Is the item at j smaller than the item at min index, which is min? So is 8 smaller than four? No, it is not. So no need to update min. Then we advance j. Is the item at j smaller than the item at min index? No, it is not.
Is the item at J smaller than the item at min index? No, it is not. We advance J. Is the item at J smaller than the item at min index? Is three less than four? Yes, it is. Now we have a new min. I'm gonna go ahead and add the index positions to all of these numbers so that we can use them to update our min index. So min index is no longer I, which is zero, and min is no longer four. Min index is now four, and min is three. We keep searching using J through the rest of the unsorted portion of the array, still looking for a value that is smaller than our min, but our min now is three. So we advance J. Is the value at J smaller than our current min? Is six smaller than three? No, it is not. Advance J. Is the value at J smaller than our min? Is nine smaller than three? No, it is not. Advance J. Is the value of J smaller than our value in min? Is two smaller than three? Yes, it is. We have a new min and a new min index. Our min is now two and our min index is now seven. Advance J. Is the value of J smaller than our min? Is five smaller than two? No, it is not. We've reached the end of our unsorted portion, the end of our array, so there's no more checking to be done. We know that the smallest value in the unsorted portion of the array is two, and it's at location seven. So what are we going to do? We're going to swap the value at i with the value at min index. So this two, which is at min index, is swapped with this four, which is at i. Now, our sorted portion of our array has grown by one. and our unsorted portion has decreased in size by one. By definition, an array or a sequence of only one item is sorted, so two is sorted, and it is our smallest item. That was one iteration of our outer for loop that drives i. Now we advance i. And we repeat, we're looking for the smallest item in the unsorted portion of the array. We find it, we swap, we advance I, we look for the smallest item in our unsorted portion of our array, we find it, we swap it, and we advance I. And this continues. I am going to trace through the rest of this, but I just wanna make sure that you see the big picture here. The idea behind selection sort is to select the smallest item in the unsorted portion of the array. Put that item in the sorted portion of the array. Continue doing that, growing the sorted portion by one, shrinking the unsorted portion by one, and eventually you will have sorted the entire array. So we're always just looking for the smallest item to place in the next spot in our sorted portion of the array. All right, let's walk through this. I'm gonna go slightly faster. All right, so we'll assume that our minimum value is eight at index position i, which is one. And then we advance j, starting at index position two, one greater than i. Is seven less than eight? Yes, it is. We have a new min. Is 10 less than seven? No. Is three less than seven? Yes, it is. 
So we have a new min. Is six less than three? No. Is nine less than three? No. Is four less than three? No. Is five less than three? No. So we do a swap and we swap the item at index position I with the item at min index, which is four. So the three and eight get swapped. The sorted portion of our array has grown in size by one and our unsorted portion has decreased in size by one. Now we advance I and we do it all over again. Okay, so our new minimum in our unsorted portion is assumed to be the value at I, which is seven. Is 10 less than seven? No. Is eight less than seven? No. Is six less than seven? Yes, it is. We have a new min. Is nine less than six? No. Is four less than six? Yes. Is five less than four? No, it's not. We do a swap. The value at I is swapped with the value at min index. So the four and the seven are swapped. And my five fell down. Our sorted portion grew in size by one and our unsorted portion shrunk in size by one. And now we advance I. Now I'm gonna go ahead and go through the rest of the algorithm pretty fast. No need to update any of our variables because I think you get the gist of the algorithm by seeing those three traces of our outer for loop that's driving I. All right, 10 is our Kerman, eight less than 10, yes. Eight is our Kerman, six less than eight, yes. Six is our Kerman, nine less than six, no. Seven less than six, no. Five less than six, yes. This is our current min. Swap. Advance I. Eight is our current min. Is six less than eight? Yes, it is. Six is our current min. Is nine less than six? No. Is seven less than six? No. Is 10 less than six? No. So we do a swap and our unsorted portion shrinks. We advance I. Eight is our Kerman. Is nine less than eight? No. Is seven less than eight? Yes. Seven is our Kerman. Is 10 less than seven? No. We do a swap. Unsorted portion shrinks and I advances. Nine is our current min. Is eight less than nine? Yes, it is. Eight is our new current min. Is 10 less than eight? No, it's not. We've reached the end of our array. We do a swap. Unsorted portion, size shrinks, advance I. Nine is our current min. Is 10 less than nine? No, it's not. Do a swap, but essentially it just swaps nine with itself. Unsorted portion is down to one, advance I and we are done. Okay, let's go ahead and code this up. Let's write a function called selection sort array. And we can be somewhat lazy here and just kind of copy the algorithm from print array, at least to get us started. No C out statements, however, in our selection sort algorithm. 
So we've got our outer for loop, which is going to start i at the beginning of the array and advance it by one all the way to the end of the array. Now we need to add our loop control variable j, which we will use as our loop control variable for our inner for loop, which finds the min in the unsorted array. So to do this, we're going to need two variables, min and min index, in order to keep track of the current minimum and the location of the current minimum. We've always assumed that min index is i and min is the value at i. We made that assumption before we started walking through using j. So we would always start j at i plus 1, and j would go to the end of the array looking for a value smaller than min. So essentially, this for loop here is a classic find minimum problem. Search through the unsorted portion of the array for a value smaller than min. At the end of this for loop, the one that's driven by j, we will have walked through the unsorted portion of the array, finding the smallest value in it. And then we're going to do the swap. So in order to do the swap, we're going to utilize a temporary variable. Or if we do this clever, in a clever manner, we don't need to make use of a temporary variable because we've got min and min index. So let's say array sub min index is assigned array sub i and array sub i is assigned min. We don't need to have a temporary variable like we usually do when we do a swap. If we do it this way, we're effectively using min index and min as our temporary variable so that we don't overwrite a value that we need. All right. So let's call our selection sort algorithm. And then we'll call print array immediately afterwards so we can see if our selection sort algorithm works. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And it looks like it does work. Sorting algorithms are incredibly important. One more motivating example I can give you, now that you have some kind of context for how a sorting algorithm is implemented, would be Perhaps anytime you're working in Excel and you have a column that you want to sort in terms of maybe ascending order, maybe there are text input that's in each one of the cells and you want it to be alphabetical, or maybe it's numeric input and you want to sort perhaps sales from individual salesmen uh, or individual companies or stock prices from highest to lowest, for example. There's a sorting routine that's being called behind the scenes in order to make that order occur. All right, now it's time to give you a task so that you can try working on this. So here's your task. Go ahead and define and call a function that is named selection sort 
vector. And it's going to sort a vector of integers. Go ahead and see if you can apply our selection sort algorithm to sort a vector instead of sorting an array. Good practice of sorting and of vectors. So the first thing we'll need to do is include the vector library so that we can use the vector data type. Then I'm going to go ahead and use these same numbers and declare a vector of type int. Call it nums vector. And I'll just initialize it to these same values just so I can see that it works for the same values. But I really should test this with some different values as well. We'll need to have a print vector function. And we'll need to have a selection sort vector function. Note that I don't need to pass in the size of the vector because I can get that with the size member function. Instead of using a standard for loop here, let's use a range-based for loop just for some good practice. All right, before we code up selection sort vector, let's make sure that our print vector is working. And there it is. Now we're ready to code up our selection sort vector. Let's do this from memory. We're not going to look we're not going to look at selection sort array in order to solve this. Okay, we also need integers for our min index and for our min. So we run this and we see that it doesn't appear that our sort function for a vector is working. What's going on here? Let's try printing our vector v at the bottom of our selection sort vector function. I'm going to put a little marker in front of it 
just so that we can see that this output is coming from selection sort vector. Look at that. It seems to show that the vector v is sorted, but back in main, when we print out the nums vector, it's not sorted. So what do you think that this means? What this means is something really important about vectors. Vectors are pass by value. In fact, this is so important, I'm gonna write it up on the board. Arrays are passed by reference. If you pass an array into a function and that function modifies the array, that does modify the same memory as the array reference back in the calling code. That is not true with vectors. Vectors are passed by value. So let's go ahead and change our selection sort vector prototype and header to make the vector being passed in passed by reference not pass by value. Now let's see if that changes anything. And it looks like it does. So this video has been really important. We've covered a sorting algorithm, selection sort. We saw the intuition behind it by tracing it on an example. And then we implemented the code for sorting arrays using the selection sort algorithm. Then we implemented the same code to sort in a vector, but we saw that that vector wasn't actually sorted back in the calling code, which was a demonstration that vectors are passed by value, not passed by reference. But with our knowledge of passed by reference and reference variables, we can easily make a vector be passed by reference so that we can write functions that do change the contents of a vector parameter and are more efficient because there doesn't have to be copying of the contents of one vector that's an argument to the contents of another vector that is the parameter. Now, just to wrap up this video, the last thing that I want to mention is back in the notes. At the bottom, there is another sorting algorithm called bubble sort. Bubble sort is included in the Gaddis textbook, so I included it here in the notes. I'm not going to go through the bubble sort algorithm in this video but I highly encourage you to take a look at the big picture and the algorithm and this example that I have found on the internet to provide a visualization of the algorithm. You can also go through the visualization website that I showed the link to earlier and get a sense of how the bubble sort algorithm works and then try to implement a bubble sort algorithm for both arrays and for vectors. Have fun with it.